Hey, it's Tony Robbins again. Welcome to the podcast. Listen, today I want to talk to you about how to do well in tough times. Because uh, most of us know that 2008 came, and many of us remember in business, it was a crazy and wild year, to say the least. And a lot of businesses didn't make it. And for those of us that found a way to not only hang in there, but to grow, to thrive, many of us innovated because of that time. Because if you can do well in winter time, if you can do time when everyone else is having a difficult time, then when things get better, you just have more momentum and you drive. In fact, if I were to ask you, when do you think is the best season to start a business? If we talked about seasons in economic terms, you know, there's the springtime when everything is growing like crazy because it's all new and it's easy to grow in the springtime of a business, like a new business or a new industry or a young economy. Um, The second season, of course, would be summertime when it's kind of hot and intense. And very often during that time, you don't get to see the reward right away. And then, of course, there's fall or autumn where you get to reap all the rewards. If you push through and did the right things in spring, you're going to reap in the fall. If you didn't, you're going to weep in the fall, right? And then, of course, there's winter. And winter is designed specifically. It's, it's in nature. There's economic winters. They come regularly, and they come with a pattern. And if you understand history, you know they're there. And what is the purpose of winter? It's to get rid of anything that's weak so that only the strong survive. And the strong survive, and they begin to thrive. For example, if you go to the Fortune 1000, the 1,000 biggest and most successful companies in the world today, you'll discover something interesting. Of the four seasons they could have begun in, more than 60% of them were begun in wintertime. I'll give you some examples. Think a little company like Apple or Microsoft, both were born in wintertime, right? In the middle of a recession, 1970s. Pizza Hut, the same thing. Exxon was in the middle of a depression, to give you an idea. Disney in the middle of a depression. Fortune Magazine in the middle of a depression. So the companies that find a way to do well during the toughest times will dominate. Now that's also true of small businesses that can hang in there and begin to grow. Because what happens during the tough times, during winters, everybody gets fearful. So companies stop investing. Individuals stop putting money into their marketing. They try to rationalize. And often what they do is they cut their capacity to meet the client's needs. And you don't just lose market share, you can lose your business. And here's what's really true. Every economic environment you can imagine, you're going to live through. There's going to be good times, there's going to be bad times, and there's going to be seasons of every type. But can you find a way to do well during those bad times? You know, one of my role models is a man named Sir John Templeton. I'm sure you've heard of him. He was the first billionaire investor, and he started with nothing. He just had this core belief that he needed to save money and wait for a time when people had what he called maximum pessimism. His belief was you become wealthy during the worst times, not the best times. And here was his thought process. He said, listen, when things are going well and you're trying to buy a piece of real estate for someone and the market's growing, what kind of price, when they're optimistic, do they want? A fair price or a ridiculously unfair price or a low price? We all know the answer. They want an unfair price. If you're trying to buy a business in good times, they want much more than it's worth. But during really tough times, if you go back to 2008, you go back to 1999, you could pick up real estate in some cases or businesses for a song. People would almost give it away because they're just so afraid of what's going to happen next. So your goal should be able to do well in winter, to really truly be in a position where when the season comes, you're prepared for it. And so I want to educate you on this so that you can really take advantage of this. And one guy to help you to do that is a friend of mine. He's a gentleman that I've watched him grow his business more than a billion dollars in the last 12 months or, or, or a little, maybe a little more, maybe it's been 14 months. But that's no slouch, a billion dollar growth. And this gentleman's name is Ashwin. Ashwin is going to kind of walk you through a little bit of how he built his company, which is a hedge fund called Trend Capital. And Ashwin Vasan is his name, dear friend of mine. He's going to share with you what he went through, what he decided to focus on so he would enjoy himself during the middle of winters, how he's worked with his people so they can do well during any environment. Most of us know it's been a pretty wild time, a lot of volatility recently, and yet Ashwin has still done really well. And then he's going to give you his point of view on the macro view of where the economy is are going. Now, this is his point of view. I'm not being disrespectful. I love him dearly, but I can't endorse any one point of view. But he's giving you his point of view so you can get a sense of if it was like that, how would I make decisions within my business and within my investment life? So I think you're going to find this to be a really, really interesting interview. So I'm going to give you straight away to Anna and to my dear friend Ashwin. Enjoy. Welcome to the Tony Robbins podcast. I'm your host, Anna York. 
And today I'm here with Ashwin Vasan, the founder and CIO at Trend Capital Management, a macro hedge fund with $1.3 billion under management. Ashwin, welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. Great. I was wondering, before we uh, get started, if you could give us a little bit of your story, so a little bit of your background and uh, how, you, um, be, how you started Trend. So the, um, I started out in the investment management business way back in 1992 on the real money uh, side. And what we mean by real money is that you know anybody who manages either mutual fund money or insurance money or pension fund money uh, is called real money because you don't leverage that money in effect. You basically buy securities with cash and you sell securities for cash. Uh, the hedge fund business is very different because securities are bought on margin. Um, and so I started back in 1992 with a company called Oppenheimer Funds, um, then proceeded to, um, to work for a couple of different uh, uh, hedge funds along the way, uh, building three different businesses. Uh, and then the time came when uh, it became very apparent to me that I'd spent enough time building businesses for other people. And it was time for me to sort of go out on my own and and uh, and and build my own own business where I had sort of more ownership and control over uh, the decision making and the uh, and and the direction in which the business was taking because I had very specific views of exactly you know who I wanted to serve and uh, and what I wanted to uh, what I wanted to achieve with my business um, in, uh, in in sort of the, the second half of my career. Right. So was this around the same time that you began to be more involved with, uh, with Tony Robbins content and events? So um, <laughs> that's a great question. So basically what happened is that we, we, I, I started the company um, in 2011 and about 12 months went by and, and, I, and I had made no money. And that's very rare for me. I mean, that, that's never happened in my career. Um, of almost 20 years, where 12 months goes by and I've not made any money. So I realized that something was really wrong. Um, probably, it, it, you know, in, in my opinion, I think the pressure of sort of starting a new business that is now entirely on your shoulders, uh, including all the management responsibilities and the, um, and the, uh, that go with it. Um, and so in March of 2012, um, I attended UPW with Tony. And that was the singular event, I think, that had that basically um, started to turn things around for me. And from then onwards, um, we've done fabulously well <laughs> as, an in, as a business. We went from about $200 million in assets under management at that time. Uh, so barely scratching and clawing when it comes to a, uh, to a hedge fund business to currently running about $1.3 billion. And, uh, and we continue to grow. Wow. Did you, just out of curiosity, did you attend Business Mastery soon after that? Um, no, I, the, the, my, the process that, that was that I, I, um, I attended UPW in Secaucus in New, uh, New Jersey at the, at the big convention center there, uh, then went to Leadership Mastery down in San Diego. And at Leadership, I signed up for Platt. And that fall, um, you know, thanks to a number of existing Platts, uh, who basically convinced me and my wife that we absolutely had to go with Tony and Sage to India. Uh, I, I did. Um, I did go to India, and that was a transformative experience for me. Um, having been born in that country and having sort of completely disassociated myself from my past, it was a way for me to sort of reconnect in a way that I'd never done. Um, and I think that kind of makes you whole as a person. Uh, as opposed to being this divided person, <laughs> which is sort of what I'd constructed for myself. Um, and I think all of that contributed to the fact that, um, you know, our investment performance took off dramatically over the subsequent, th uh, you know, three or four years. And, um, and that that came, uh, came, you know, not just uh, assets under management, but, uh, you know, several accolades along the way in terms of, um, from the industry, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the numbers we've produced. Yeah, that's fascinating, especially because recently Tony has been talking a lot about um, overachievers, right? We're so driven by achievement and it's a science and a formula and we stick with it, but we forget about the art of fulfillment. Um, but it's nice that once you, you know, you can be a high achiever and then also seek fulfillment, but then it cycles back and it affects your achievement as well. So it sounds like that's kind of, it sounds like that's similar to what happened with you. Yeah, look, it's, it's a... Um 
I think this is a this is a very my path. I think is a very very common story that you'll find amongst, especially amongst men, uh, who are um, you know who have a very high orange consciousness, if you will. And so what happened is what typically happens to us is is that in our youth we're so focused on just basically establishing our place as a man within our brotherhood. Um, that we it comes at the expense of everything else. Frequently, it comes at the expense of families, relationships, et cetera, et cetera. But then a point comes when I think, as as a man, yes, you achieve success. You've you know a, you know perhaps you've even acquired a few toys along the way, uh, and then you realize that you're just not you're just not being fulfilled in the way that you want, and there's something missing. It's funny because you always know that there's something missing, but you don't really it, it takes a it takes a certain point i think in a man's life when he's finally willing to um stop and focus on that uh on on what's missing you know tony always tells us you know most men don't own themselves till they're at least 40 years of age and it was approximately around that time that you know all this uh, all this happened for me well great so uh, talking about the beginning of the company, so um, as I mentioned, I think that um, bringing with you your team from, uh, from your previous employer and having that trust factor, um, but so that's a nice foundation. But as you began to grow the company, what were some of the challenges that you faced when it comes to personnel, when it came to scaling or culture? Was there anything that was... Um, a big issue that you faced even after those 12 months that you kind of got over the initial hump that you talked about? Yeah, look, the, the, um, my case was, was, was and, and it was perhaps a little unique because of the kind of industry that I'm in, meaning when you're an investor um, and you're a professional investor like I am, your, your life, your focus is always on that. In fact, most, prof- no, most really good professional investors I know never really turn off, meaning they see something even as simple as when they're driving down the road, they'll see a billboard and it'll start, things will start moving in their mind as to what that means in terms of their ability to make money, money for their investors. Um, that's a very unique and very specialized skill. And in particularly in my case, where you run a global macro fund requires an enormous amount of specialized training, um, which very few people get. That's why there are so few people who are so good at good in the, in, in the, in the global macro industry. That's very different than running a business because running a business requires you to, as you very correctly said, hire people, mentor people, grow people, um, deal with generalized business issues. And now in the, in the day and age that we are in today, we have to deal a lot with things like uh, SEC regulations and things like that. I didn't have any illusions about the fact that I could make this transition very smoothly uh, between being a um, investor to now being a business manager. And so, you know, very early on, you know, when I was at one of Tony's conferences and I saw that um, he had um, a business results uh, uh, coaching uh, set up uh, booth there. And I immediately, you know, spoke to uh, the people in the booth and uh, and, uh, and and Scott Chamberlain in in, in particular, and uh, and signed up for that. And that's been a very big part of why we've been very successful, because number one, the entire business gets coaching. So it's not me as well as all my employees get coached in terms of you know the, the business and setting the agenda. The employees get coached individually and uh, and mentored individually because this business is a very um, it's a very unforgiving business because you get a report card every single day. And very few businesses get a report card in the nature that we get a report card every single day in our business. And sometimes a report card can be pretty brutal. Um, And so you really need to, you know, um, in terms of growing an organization and putting resources and support behind an organization, um, that was very, very important to me because the one thing I'd noticed in my career was that there are so many people who set up these businesses, but then they, they basically create farm teams for other people. And I had no intention of doing that. I wanted a very special kind of people around me, having now been, you know, one of Tony's students. Uh, I didn't, you know, I did not want people that were very significance and uh, and certainty driven. I wanted a very different sort of makeup. Um, and so using the tools that came from business results, as well as the tools that I've, that I've learned through Tony and his organization, I was able to hire, recruit, and sustain people. 
And more importantly, you know, I don't believe in the chainsaw owl principle of running a business. It's so easy to go around chopping heads and firing people. It's a lot harder to mentor and grow and develop people. So we, the, one of the things I'm most proud about within this organization is that we've had people here who've had challenges like everybody will, every organization will have, you know, you'll have people who've had challenges, but we've been able to turn them around because of the work we've done, you know, the work that I've done with Tony, the, the, you know, the, the coaching that the organization gets through Tony, et cetera. And when we go through incredibly difficult periods in the, in the markets, what is really amazing about this organization and why we've been so successful is that because all these guys are getting, and, and gals are getting, you know, intensively coached by their, uh, by their Tony Robbins coaches, we sail through that. There's no panic. Nobody's like running under, you know, you know, hiding under tables because we've lost so much money. There's nothing like that. There's just a very, there's a sense of calm. There's a sense of, you know, okay, what's next? What do we need to do to make it back? Uh, it's a very pragmatic, very practical approach and a very constructive approach. And that's why I think we've been able to serve our investors as well as, as, well as we've been able to. Sure. That fits in so perfectly into Tony's, um, you know, in the, the book Money Master the Game when he uh, he talks to, who was it? Was it, uh, oh, what is his name? Jack Bogle. Uh, and basically he says, you know, when things go well, uh, don't don't do something, don't do something, just stand there. Right. And in your business and your particular area, um, that's a great skill to have because it's very easy to feel that economic winter that Tony talks about and that fear and to drive you to make emotional decisions instead of rational decisions. That's right. So that's great. And, and the fear will always be there. I mean, to be, to be perfectly clear, I mean, the fear serves a purpose. It prevents you from taking risks which are perhaps inordinate. The fear will always be there. The question is whether, you know, whether the fear is controlling you or not, as you correctly pointed out, and if you can if you can keep the fear in its appropriate role within your life, it can actually be an enormously powerful servant to you and 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 help you uh, and and help you navigate this process, especially in my industry. Yeah. Sure. So, speaking of fear, yes. <laughs> let's talk about <laughs> the markets. <laughs> yeah. Um, can you give us an idea? about we, where we are at right now, um, sort of going into 2016, uh, what are you most interested in? Now look, you know, the, um, the reason I pushed this call back an hour uh, today was precisely because we are at a historic juncture. In about two hours, we will get an announcement from the Federal Reserve that they will be hiking rates for the first time in almost a decade. Um, we've gone through an extraordinary period in the global economy whereby central banks everywhere have been incredibly concerned about banking system risks and deflation risks as a consequence. And so they've been doing everything possible to ensure that there's as much liquidity in the system as possible and also trying to, to pump as much money in the system as possible in order to raise inflation rates. Well, Guess what? I mean, I think the U.S. economy is the first of these countries to sort of emerge from that process, meaning we finally got an economy where the labor markets have healed dramatically. You know, the economy is generating about, you know, almost three million jobs a year. Um, inflation is coming back to more normalized um, uh, no, uh, levels. Uh, we just had an inflation print this week, which reflected that. And so the Federal Reserve is going to be hiking rates. But that's going to be very different, I think, from what's going on with some of the other major central banks, such as the European Central Bank and the, and, and the Bank of Japan. They're both going to be keeping rates on, uh, on, uh, on hold and even easing policy further, as the ECB just announced. That divergence in monetary policy is something very unique, has rarely happened in the history of this planet amongst the big three central banks. And I think will be a very, very important driver of asset returns into going into 2016. Um, it will mean that the dollar will get stronger over time. It will mean that U.S. bond yields will go higher. Um, it will mean that inflation prints in the U.S. will go higher, which is going to be a big risk for bond investors here in the U.S. And we would caution bond investors to be very, very cautious about how they construct their bond portfolios. 
in fact, the single biggest risk we think to everybody in, right now as an investor, especially in the United States, is how do you make money in fixed income over the next two years? Um, people have been very fortunate over the past, you know, since the global financial crisis, you could have owned stocks and you could have owned bonds and you made money on both those things. You just have to close your eyes. You just have to own something. Now you're going to be in a situation where stocks are going to be much more volatile. They'll still generate positive returns, but it's going to be much more volatile. Bonds are going to generate negative returns. So constructing portfolios is going to be very, 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 very uh, uh, ch uh, challenging for a lot of people if they're not careful. So I think that's something that we would we would uh, we would talk to people about. The second thing that we tell you is that, look, it's very clear that geopolitical risks have picked up. Um, we definitely think that uh, what is going on with uh, the whole un uh, unfortunate situation in the Middle East with ISIS, etc., is something that's here to stay with us for a while. Um, ISIS is winning the marketing campaign, if you will. Uh, the unfortunate comments by some of our presidential candidates here in the United States about banning Muslims from entering this country will only further uh, the entire ISIS uh, um, uh, propaganda. Um, we would offer very humbly that if you take a look at other countries that have historically had very diverse populations come uh, living in, amongst in their midst, the way to solve this problem is not through you know walls, but it's by assimilation. Because once everybody's married to everybody, you really can't go around killing people. Uh, so the, uh, the that is that is the that's that's the real tragedy about this whole this whole uh, this whole game and and I would encourage anybody who's living to listening to this podcast is that if you if you can do if you can do one thing in the new year as sort of your your good deed or your resolution then go then then find an organization which will sponsor one child in 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 those in those Syrian refugee camps in Jordan and just pay for the education for that child because if you can do that and you can get these kids educated and out of those camps you've just taken away a huge recruiting base for ISIS and that will be very very powerful over time i think for people um the other thing i we would tell people is that um Expect that the relationships between the West and, and Russia would be continue to be a, a very stressful one. We think the Cold War is back. You should expect more volatility around that. So the events that we saw where you know the Turks downed a Russian uh, uh, a Sukhoi jet, uh, which um, entered their airspace, things like that will become more of the norm uh, going forward. Um, we are deeply, deeply concerned about the, the leadership that's in Russia right now. Um, the um, the concerns the concerns that people have uh, in the marketplace that China is somehow going to um, evaporate and, uh, and 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 be a systemic risk to the global markets I think is completely uh, you know people are not understanding the nature of the Chinese economy you cannot look at China with the same lens that you look at a a, uh, a democratic capitalist country in China the person who who has borrowed is the same person who has lent, meaning state-owned companies have borrowed from state-owned banks. That's the Chinese situation. That's why you don't have a systemic financial crisis. And if you look at every single crisis we've had in the global economy since Mexico in 1994, which is relevant to me because that's around the time that I started in this business, um, you know, whether it's Mexico, whether it's Asia, whether it's, you know, um, Argentina, it's uh, whether it's the United States, whether it's you know um, Europe, um, there's no systemic financial crisis without a banking crisis, because we live in a fractional reserve deposit insurance system. Therefore, when a country gets into real trouble, banks are the first to go, and so we don't believe that Chinese banks will ever be allowed to have this kind of problem. So it's not that China is going to be a gangbuster and is going to is going to propel growth in the in the global economy like it did in the past. But what it will do is that you will have a managed slowdown, which is what you're having in China. So growth went from 10% to 8% to 7% to 6% and they'll probably end up close to 5%. And um, that has serious implications for commodity prices as well as growth in some of the uh, the Asian economies going forward. Um, so that's sort of the the broad picture outlook that I would I would uh, I would I would lay out for you to, to sum up if I would if I were to guide an in individual investor as to what to expect in 2016 I would tell him especially a US based investor um, I would tell him 
him or her, number one, um, be very mindful of how you construct your fixed income part of your portfolios because that is the biggest single risk to markets right now. Um, fixed income has generated positive returns every single year since the global financial crisis. Um, and this is the first year of negative returns and we expect that to continue. Uh, especially things like government bonds are extremely dangerous um, in terms of, uh, of because of where, how low yields are and because we expect interest rates to rise. Number two, we would tell you that equities will continue to generate positive returns, not at the same rate that they've done in the past, but anywhere, you know, um, you know, eight to 10 percent and with significantly better returns in overseas markets such as Europe and Japan would would be uh, would be something that we would expect. Um, but it will be much more volatile than it has been in the past as well. The third thing that we would uh, we would uh, you know, ask investors to um, to pay attention to is the fact that, look, you should expect that with the Fed hiking rates and uh, major central banks like the ECB and the Bank of Japan not hiking rates, in fact, easing policy, that the dollar is going to get stronger. So you should be aware of how much currency risk you have in your portfolios, especially as you own international equities in your portfolio. There are ways to buy international equities on a hedged basis, and you should probably look at that uh, as, as, the, as the, the safest way to play those markets. And lastly, we would tell you that given the fact that um, the challenge in markets right now is the fact that uh, finding ways to earn income in a safe way is difficult, one needs to really be, pay a lot of attention to the diversity of your portfolios. And you're going to have to look at things, uh, perhaps like things like investments in real estate, et cetera, that can earn you a decent yield without the kind of volatility that we expect and, and capital losses that we expect will be generated by the fixed income markets. Great. So a lot of that seems to um, actually come back to, um, you know, we've got the international, at the international level, some of the, um, the factors that come into play there. But I'm also curious about um, this coming year domestically, how do you think our political climate, so the upcoming elections, <laughs> you can tell that's a question people have probably asked you before, how, uh, what kind of impact do you think that will have? We're not we're not that focused, frankly, um, on the, the the specific candidate that is going to be elected. And honest, to be very honest with you, the reasons are twofold. Number one, in the United States, both political parties are centrist parties. They make big noises about how different they are, but those noises are typically made by the fringe. So it's either made by sort of the the rainbow coalition within the Democratic Party or the or the Liberal Democrats, uh, on one hand, or it's made by um, made by the the sort of the the Tea Party conservatives within the the Republican Party. So, but those those two fringes, while they can make a lot of noise, and sometimes they can actually uh, uh, drive a, a, a few policy choices. At the end of the day, they don't determine the long term aggregate policy of the United States. Um, the long term aggregate policy of the United States is de is determined by the center, and this country tends to be very centrist in its in its in its uh, in its voting uh, voting behavior. Um, I think it's two thirds of this population identifies themselves as fiscally conservative and socially liberal. So, um, something like that. So, the um, the other the the second reason we're not that focused on the politics, frankly, is because <laughs> the candidates are just so awful, just awful. And so, for us, you know, it's just very difficult. Uh, it, it's it's sort of watching like a, it's it's sort of like watching a cartoon show. It's just very difficult for us to to handicap these candidates because um, none of them we think is going to dramatically change the direction of the country onto a better path. Uh, you know, you can have arguments, and and if you're partisan enough, you will have arguments about how one is going to be better than the other. Uh, but at the end of the day, what's really for us as investors, what really matters for us is transformation. Uh, the real money is made in transformation. So what we're looking for is countries which are going through a major transformation from being horrible to being really good. So, for example, a Modi administration being appointed in India, that was transformation. 
And that's why India is doing dramatically better and is probably one of the few places where you want to close your eyes and put your money for the next 10 years. Uh, the recent uh, Macri administration in Argentina, that's an example of transformation after, you know, over a decade of a, of, of a disaster with the, with the, with the two Kirchner uh, presidents. So that's, where the, that's what we look for as investors. Uh, what's, going to go, what's going to happen in the United States is not transformation. It's just going to be politics as usual. Horse trading you know, um, we never call it corruption in the United States. We call it politi political action committees, um, but that sort of stuff. Okay. Uh, actually, I think that about does it. I have one, okay. one more question for you. Uh, I yes. heard a rumor that you came to the Platt finance trip and um, were very, very good at explaining some of the more sophisticated concepts to oh. to everybody in the in the room are you are you going to do the same thing this year in sun <laughs> valley <laughs> um i'm 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 uh, i'm working with uh with tony to bring you know maybe one uh, there's one speaker that i've already committed to bringing in and there may be there may be um at least one more that i will talk to him about that i'd like to bring in and and, uh, and have have him talk to the plats simply because i think that the um the, the the spectrum of expertise that's that's in that room is very varied. There are maybe a few people like myself who are in the industry who are professional investors and who can who can understand everything that's said. Um, but for the vast majority of people, you know, it's really sort of building blocks. And one of the things I've noticed, especially after spending a lot of time uh, with the Platts and uh, and and uh, and with just with friends of mine who are non plats is that so many people are so good at making money as entrepreneurs. You know, they can make the best widget in the world, but they have no clue about how to invest their money. And so it's getting them to a place where they're comfortable uh, investing their money in an organized fashion so that that wealth continues to grow and, you know, and, 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 and preserves its real value, meaning it grows ahead of inflation. Uh, you know, over time, and then they will hopefully have something that they can they can either bequest to their heirs or or to uh, or to charity. That process is something that's very near and dear to me in terms of sort of helping them do this. And so that's really why I will, if I do anything there, I'll do something like you know, I'll, I'll be involved in that process. And that's why I spend you know, I, I give as much time and effort as I do into that. That's great because it's personal finance is one of those areas that. I think a lot of people, you get to a certain point and you just, you don't understand it. So you just want to outsource it, but it's personal. It's like your health or your relationships. You don't, you don't outsource that. You just educate yourself enough to make the right decisions. And then yeah. when it comes to, when it gets more complicated, then yes, you know, you bring in professional help, but I think that's great that you're helping sort of close that information gap. Yeah. Look, um, I'm, it's very sweet of you to say that. So if if, it, if it's having an impact, I'm I'm happy that it is, and if people are using it, you know, you know, I'm very grateful for that. It's um, Tony's done a tremendous job of, of of bringing together certain concepts, frankly, that even for people like me who are in the industry, we don't focus as much on it because we focus probably a hundred times more on our investment portfolios for our clients than we do on our personal portfolios. So you know. Him just basically turning on the light bulb and saying, "Listen, you need to flashing the torchlight and then saying, you see that little dark corner there? That needs to be. You need to put some light there and you need to fix that issue." Um, it's been very helpful to me, and so um, yeah, I think it, that that particular fi finance conference is is really amazing. I always come back from that incredibly energized and uh, and. Uh, always some there are some ideas even for me that are cropping up because of uh, talking to other managers who are in the industry. Great. All right. Well, thank you, Ashwin, so much for your time. You're very welcome. All right. Okay. Have, a, have a good afternoon. Thanks. You too. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Do you have the right mindset and skills to take your business to the next level? Business Mastery is the only event in the world created by Tony Robbins to prepare you to master the mindset and skills you need in business to elevate your game. A one-of-a-kind, immersive program, Business Mastery will allow you to understand the critical factors impacting your business, then refocus and realign with the strategy and psychology you need to compete and innovate in any economy. Remember, business success is 80% psychology and 20% mechanics. 
If you're ready to learn and master the strategies to help you grow your business and stay competitive, then don't hesitate. Apply for the next Business Mastery program now. Learn more about the Business Mastery event at www.tonyrobbins.com. The Tony Robbins Podcast is directed by Tony Robbins, hosted by Annie York, and produced by Carrie Song. Brooks Loro is our digital editor. Tyler Culbertson is our media coordinator. Special thanks to Diane Adcock for her creative review. Our website is tonyrobbins.com forward slash podcast, where you can listen to all of our episodes, read articles, and learn more about upcoming events. Copyright Robbins Research International.